Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is it now I'm on? on? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Levine, where, where are you? Okay, you're already there. <laughs> For your wonderful introduction as well as uh, invitation to this uh, enrichment program, which I enjoyed uh, enormously over the last two, day, two days. And also, I'd like to thank you all <laughs> coming back, uh, despite that this is a very awkward time. <laughs> Aren't you hungry? <laughs> okay. Um, I've been here before, about uh, four years ago, and enjoyed the stay very much. So when uh, Nivin asked me to come again, um, I accepted the uh, invitations uh, right away. The problem was the theme of this uh, enrichment program, I later realized, is a personalized medicine. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? Well, because I never worked on this personalized medicine, at least directly. So uh, I scratched my head and see, wow, try to figure out, so what would you like to say? So I, maybe I should start, put the, So I thought of by the time I, I'm on this stage, somebody will tell or at least define what the personalized medicine is. But so far, I haven't heard anything about the personalized medicine. <laughs> George or Jonathan <laughs> mentioned something different, and they talked about so what they do. But nevertheless, uh, it's a maybe a good chance to talk about the personalized medicine. It is my understanding, and you may agree, what we ultimately would like to have is the medicine that precisely personalized for individual person. Instead of uh, this uh, current, this uh, one treat treatment fits all type of medicine, which will significantly improve the medical and health care. The question is then, how do you achieve that personalized medicine? Well, we now live in a post genomic era. Most of the human genome information is available, providing a new opportunity for personalized medicine. However, that is not enough. Although the genes provide us a blueprint for life, it must be translated into the proteins that actually make life happen, driving all this biological process. So it is not surprising to see that most of the current drug targets proteins. So in order to achieve personalized medicine, what you need is not only genomic information, but also proteomic information for individuals. But the situation is not so simple when it comes to the proteins, as they don't play alone. They usually work with other proteins in a very complex and a dynamic manner, which makes proteomic analysis very, very challenging, as we will know. Nevertheless, once you achieve this accurate and precise proteomic, proteomics or proteomic analysis can lead precision diagnostic, uh, diagnosis and therapeutics that ultimately lead to perhaps precision medicine or personalized medicine. As I said before, I never worked on the personalized medicine, at least directly. I'm just a supramolecular chemist, mostly focusing on fundamental problems. But nevertheless, what we've been doing is closely related to this personalized medicine, as you would see. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is to introduce one of the new chemical tools we 
we have developed over the last 15 years that we call supramolecular latch. That can be useful in many different areas, including chemistry, biology, and material science. But most importantly, I believe it can contribute to this accurate and precise proteomic analysis, which can lead to the sufficient di uh, diagnosis and therapeutics. And it can also contribute to the production of biopharmaceuticals at a lower cost and higher efficiency, as you will see in my talk later. So this is a brief outline of my talk today. I will start with a family of cucurbitril. This is a host molecule cucurbitril. And then introduce the supramolecular latch, as I said, and talk about some of the applications, especially on biomedical areas. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this molecule. I noticed that uh, some of you are not uh, chemists, so quickly highlight some of the key features of this molecule. It is a macrocycling molecule comprising six, I'm not sure I can, wow, it's challenging. I was told that I should touch, not to touch any button, otherwise I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, so it consists of six of these building units to make uh, this macrocycle. Overall shape of this molecule looks like pumpkin, hollowed out pumpkin, which belongs, belongs to the botanical family of cucurbitaceae. So therefore it was named cucurbit oil. But it's rather difficult to pronounce and rather difficult to remember. So at some point, we decided to use acronym CB or CB6, indicating that uh, it's a hexameric species. It has uh, many interesting properties. However, one of the most exciting properties of this molecule is that it binds small molecules and ions with a very high affinity, selectivity in aqueous solution. For instance, uh, it of course binds very tightly alkyl ammonium ions as illustrated by this high binding constant. And as Nivin mentioned this about two, 20 years ago, we and others discovered and successfully isolated other members of this host family. Initially, thought, it was thought that this reaction produced only hexameric species, but it turns out by controlling the, uh, the reaction temperature, we can produce other kinetic products, such as a CB5 to CB10. Perhaps as you notice, going from this CB5 to CB10, the ring size gets larger, and it, it can accommodate the larger gas molecules. Now we can introduce any functional groups at the periphery of these molecules. By following this procedure, we develop and other also develop. And mostly, uh, most recently, we published one very straightforward and high yield this transformation procedure published in JAX recently. So I'm not going to talk about that uh, today. But uh, if you're interested, in, I'm happy to answer you any questions. So, we now will be able to attach this, some floor pores, as you will see later. We can um, anchor this molecule on the surface, or we can tether this one to this, the other biomolecules or polymers. These are the, some of the examples, uh, representative ex examples of uh, what we can do with this uh, functionalized cucurbitrils, ranging from uh, sensors and drug delivery vehicles. We also explore the polymeric materials of this uh, host molecule, but mostly I like to focus on these biological applications today. 
Let me first show you one simple example we ex recently explored. Have you heard this uh, amphetamine? Anyone heard this am amphetamine? Oh, wow. Do you use it? <laughs> no? <laughs> no, better not, maybe. <laughs> As I said here, it's, it's a drug stimulates the central nervous system by enhancing the synaptic activity of the neurotransmitters. It has a positive effects such as the uh, um, suppressing uh, appetite and improve this um, feeling so you, you feel some more in control and so concentrate on things better. So it's an uh, active ingredient of this uh, FDA approved uh, drug such as it's, uh, Adderall. It's known to treat uh, ADHD or depression or obesity and so on and so forth. And um, it also quite uh, popular in among the uh, students because you can concentrate on study without eating or without sleeping. All right? How wonderful. But the problem is some people use a high dose of this, uh, this drug for recreational purposes. If you keep doing this, then you will end up with this problem. That includes of course, so you are addicted, and so you have a sleeping problem, insomnia, and sometimes, yes, so you are depressed, and so on and so forth. And there are other types, similar structure and similar functions, such as this uh, known as ice or ecstasy. And these are known as amphetamines or stimulus or ATS. And abuse of this is a ATS become a global problem, as illustrated by this drug report, World Map. And this country is not free from this issue. As you notice here, quantity of seas is in this country is enormous. So as a chemist, we must do something about it. We must help society to stop this abuse of this drug. So one thing we can do as a chemist is to, be, to develop a fast, easy, and sensitive, and portable, perhaps, can be used in on-site instead of a conventional method. We current method requires very long time, large amounts, samples, and also requires very sophisticated benchtop instrument uh, equipment, such as a GCMS. So with that idea, one of the team leaders of our, our center, Dr. Wang, thought that CB7 might, this molecule, or ATS, quite selectively and nice tightly, as they all contain this amine, which turned to the ammonium ion in the neutral pH. And also they have this phenyl group, and therefore it nicely fit in this CB7 cavity. Sure enough, he treated with this CB7, it binds this ATS molecule in one-to-one stoichiometry that has been confirmed by NMR, mass, and many other techniques. And binding constant is quite decent, 10 to the 6. Encouraged by this result, we decided to develop a ATS sensor based on OFAT, organic field effect transistor, in collaboration with our colleague in chemical engineering department at the time, Professor O. Oh, he now moved to Seoul National University. We lost many talented people, young people, John. They all <laughs> love to live in the Seoul area, unfortunately. <laughs> so. <clears throat> <clears throat> what they did is uh, a spin coat, this is CB7, on the organic this, uh, transistor layer, semiconductor layer, to make it this device. Sure enough, it's a, 
it, it can detect this ATS even with one drop of its urine. And it's so fast and so easy, it just takes a few seconds to get this signal. And the sensitivity, as shown here, is down to one picomolar. This is quite surprising. We went ahead and we can make a flexible device, and we can also connect it with a wireless communication system. So now you can see this is the result with your smartphone on, on, on site. Okay. So this quick illustration of what we can do with these exciting molecules. Let me move on to this uh, main topic of uh, today. Perhaps you may know this, the uh, streptavidin or avidin biotin system is the strongest non-covalent interaction pair existing in nature with a binding constant of 10 to the 13th or 10 to the 15th, depending on which one you are talking about. Because of this high affinity and selectivity, it has been widely used in biological area, including immunoassay, imaging, and affinity chromatography, and so on and so forth. However, this is not the perfect system, at least from a chemistry point of view. First of all, it can difficult to control this binding. It's almost irreversible. Once it forms as a one-to-one -one complex, it's stuck there. It doesn't release this biotin. And streptavidin or avidin is a protein. It's a huge. Sometimes such a huge is not advantageous. And it can be easily denatured by heat or solvent and so on and so forth. So as a chemist, it would be nice to have a synthetic analog, synthetic receptor ligand system that can replace this bio system and for many applications where biotin everything has been extensively used. However, this is quite challenging. Up until 2005, when it publishes our paper in a, in a minute, I'll show you in a minute, no one has succeeded in making a synthetic ligand receptor pair with a binding of the affinity greater than 10 to the 9th. That's the fact. Nevertheless, while exploring this host gas chemistry of this uh, new family of members of the host family, we and uh, Lyle Isaacs, who was here a couple of days ago, I noticed him. He, he couldn't make it. Oh, I thought it was, he was here. Oh, I saw it as a, a program. Okay. We independently discovered that at the same time, CB7 combines some small molecules of extremely high binding affinity as illustrated here. So for instance, do you recognize this molecule? It's a ferrocene. And if you have a one ammonium ion here, it binds with a binding constant 10 to the 12. We didn't do anything. It's just there, CB7, and we tested it. Stuck there. And other small molecules such as adamantane ammonium ion, or if you have a two, this one is a, it binds even more tightly. And this is the champion value that Lilice has reported a few years ago. Notice that the binding of is 10 to the seventh, which exceeds that of the natural system. That was our SI as 10 to the 15th. So this is a really a rare example, one of the rare examples of the, the synthetic system can truly beat the natural system. That's not a trivial thing to do, right? Having seen such a high binding affinity, we thought it may be useful in many applications where it's a, stepped up in biotin has been used. So we start exploring, and more recently, we decide to call it a supramolecular latch. So what it does is to bring these two molecules or moieties together, 
and tie them in non-covalent manner. And it has many advantages over natural ones, such as startup inviting system. First of all, it forms a very stable complex, thermodynamically and kinetically. It doesn't dissociate, it doesn't dissociate easily. More importantly, as you will see here, this is a bioorthogonal. It is not interfered by most biomolecules. And we can tune this binding ability, and also we can make it reversible, and so on and so forth. So you will see this, the, each of these uh, this advantage in my talk later. So over the last 15 years, we've been exploring this application of the supramolecular latch that includes immobilization of the biomolecules on the surface, and protein imaging, and proteomics, and so on forth. I'll introduce this one by one from now. So after seeing uh, this high affinity host gas complex, we immediately realized, as I said, it can be used as the uh, non-covalent ligation technique. At the time, we were very much interested in an immobilization of this enzyme on a surface. So we decided to explore that using this CB7 and its corresponding gas pairs. So what we did here is uh, first immobilize the CB7 on a gold surface. And also we need to have uh, this protein have some handle. In this case, it's a ferrocene ammonium ion. Once you attach this one, and simply shaking this one in a solution containing this CB7 gold substrate, you can anchor this one on the surface, as illustrated by this SPR signals. Interestingly, since at, at the time we used this uh, glucose oxidase as a model protein, that can transform this is glucose, gluconic acid, and as shown here, as you increase the concentration of glucose, you can see this increase of the signals. So therefore, it can be used as a glucose sensor. More recently, we extended this work to immobilize uh, other molecules, biomolecules, such as this uh, up aptamer, and the principle is the same. And as demonstrated here, that aptamer can recognize specific proteins, in this case, a thrombin. Therefore, we can utilize this one as thrombin sensor. I just want to briefly introduce a one non-biological application that is a supramolecular velcro. This work is inspired by, but not nature, but uh, man-made inventions. I'm sure you all know this, what the velcro is. It's a hook and uh, loop fastener. But interesting thing is that we can make, uh, yes, velcro-like adhesive that works even in water. Okay. As you know, the most adhesive works in the dry condition. Once it's wet, it doesn't do much job, right? But this whole chemistry is works in water. Therefore, this uh, supramolecular velcro would work, and we can tune this, uh, this strength, and also it can make it reversible. So with that idea, first thing we did was to attach this uh, CB7 on a silicon vapor. And on the counter surface, we introduced this ferrocene ammonium ion. Sure enough, if you bring them together, they stop. Even in water, and even after shaking, they do not fall apart. Of course, without CB7, they fall apart immediately. How strong they are can attach? Well, it can strong enough to hold this heavy weight up to two kilos, as illustrated here. 
and we can also make it reversible by treating with uh, so oxidizing agent that can oxidize a ferrocene to a ferrocenium ion. We can also make it reversible. So that was a quick, very interesting uh, application, but I will mainly focus on its uh, biological application today. So I will move, come back to this, one of these uh, biological, uh, this, uh, another tool useful in uh, biology. What I show you here is that host molecule having a it's, uh, one fluorophore and gas molecule another fluorophore. Idea is once they form a host gas complex, these, these two fluorophores is now in close proximity. Therefore, we may see a threat fluorescence or faster resonance energy transfer which has been widely used in imaging and uh, biological process, right? So with that idea, first thing we did was attach this uh, Psi-3 to this uh, CB7 and Psi-5 to the uh, adamantine ammonium ion. Sure enough, when we mix together and shine this laser to this uh, Psi-3 chromophore, it decreased this fluorescence and increase this Psi 5 signal, indicating that indeed a fresh signal, we observe the fresh signal. Using this FRET pair, first thing we did was develop a, a single vesicle content mixing assay in collaboration with uh, Professor Nam Gil Lee at the time, physics department of our university. He now moved to Seoul Lash University. Once you got them. <laughs> Boy. So what we did here is that we encapsulate diatesis host and gas molecule in two separate vesicles and allow them to fuse mediated by the protein called snare. Once they meet, and fuse, then these molecules are released from this, yes, the vesicle through the spore and form a complex immediately and shows this uh, fresh signal. So using this fresh signal, we can monitor this fusion and content mixing process in, at a single vesicle level. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. What we observe is uh, something unexpected. So common notion was that when these two vesicles are mixed, are uh, fused and contents are mixed, people thought that uh, it occurs at once. But that was not the case. Yes, in most of the time, yes, it mixed at once, but almost 20% cases in mix at twice, or it requires a two steps or three steps. So that has some implication of the sort of actual system, especially neuronal uh, signal transmission, yes, the process, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Having seen this, we realized that this, this host gas FRAP pair may be useful in monitoring and biological process as a supramolecular beacon. So in order to confirm this idea, we wanna make sure that this host gas complexation can occur in a very complex environment, such as in cell. So, Postdoc from China and graduate student Ara, they did this ex experiment. What they did was treat the cell with a Cy8 attached CB7 or Cy5 and Cy5 attached to the adamantane. When they treat that cell separately, you can clearly see this Cy3 signal and Cy5 signal. And when they treated both, 
in sequential manner. Of course, as we expected, and as we seen in this uh, in vitro system, they show this uh, fresh signal, clearly indicating that this host gas complexation can occur even in very complex environments such as cell. However, later we realized that there is something weird. That is, turns out this is uh, dye attached to CB7 is internalized and mostly end up with a lysosome. Whereas this gas molecule, adamantane, attached, these are flow four attached to adamantane, sneak in and end up with some mito. Then how they meet and form a complex? That was really puzzling us at the time. But later we realized that It can happen through this fusion of these two organelles, it's known as autophage, which led to the Nobel Prize three years ago, as you may remember. I don't have time to talk about it in detail, but certainly if you treat the cell with this autophage inhibitor, such as chloroquine, this process stops, indicating that indeed what we observe is this uh, autophage process, in this case, a mitophage, I guess. Mitophage fused in with this uh, lysosome. And once they fuse, then we can see this effect, as we have seen in, this is in the beaker earlier. Let me qu quickly move on to another biological application of a supranomical latch now. As you know, this uh, imaging of a protein sub interest is uh, very important because it can tell us where they are, how much they are, and what they do, right? So therefore, they can provide us a very important healthcare information that can be led us, lead us to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Here again, Statabidin biotin system has been used to do that. And this is pretty much a standard protocol to visualize the proteins using this system. First thing we should need to do is to attach the biotin to its protein of interest. That's known as a biotinylation. And this handle can be recognized by fluorophore attached streptobiotin, as illustrated by this image showing a, it's a biotin it's a filament actin stained with a rhodamine st attached streptobiotin. Uh, However, this system has a problem. One problem is, as you may know, this is, there are plenty of endogenous biotin in the cell that interfere with the streptobiotin, therefore reduce the sensitivity of this one, as illustrated here. There are many biotins around, highlighted in, in the screen in this case. More serious problem is there are also a number of endogenously biotinylated proteins. They can give you a false positive, right? And of course, this is a streptobidin, this is a protein, and Molecular weight is uh, about uh, 53 kilodalton, so sensitivity of the imaging uh, is, can be low due to this uh, large size. Knowing this is a limitation, we thought that uh, our supranomic latch can do a better job in visualization of this uh, protein of interest. So similar to Biotinylation, we can first introduce a chemical handle such as uh, um, uh, adamantyl um, ammonium ion moiety or ferrocin ammonium ion moiety, which we call now adamantylation or ferrocinylation. Once you attach this chemical handle, that can be recognized by 
floor four attached to CBIN seven, and therefore we can visualize protein of interest. It has a, a number of advantages over the synthetic system. Most notoriously, most importantly, it's a bioorthogonal. It's not interfered with as a, any biomolecule in the cell. And so it is small, and therefore it can be easily uptake by the cells and so on and so forth. So this is actually what we do. As I said, first thing we need to do is ferrocinolate introduce R. This is the case this, to visualize. We visualize a plasma membrane proteins. First thing we need to do is, as, as I said, introduce a chemical handle, such as a ferrocinyl ammonium moiety or adamantine ammonium moiety. In this case, we did the ferrocinylation. After that, we treat that with a Psi 3 connected to CB7. And bingo, we can see mainly the emergence of this red color around this outside of the membrane, uh, outside of the cell clearly indicate that we are visualizing that the proteins located in the plasma membranes. Not only the plasma membranes, uh, proteins, we can of course visualize any proteins in any organelle in the cell or any specific proteins as illustrated here. Even the proteins on the surface of the small animals such as C. elegans as illustrated here. The question is, does it do a better job than the streptavidin biotin system? Yes, it does. To demonstrate that, we did uh, one control experiment that can be, yes, a protein is in, in the Golgi, that's Golgi, nine, Golgi 97, specifically located in Golgi. It visualized stains in two different methods, conventional Steptavidin biotin method and our method. And there is an independent way of this, uh, you, these, uh, also independently sustain this one as a, uh, using a primary and secondary antibody. As you see here, our method shows much better if you follow this, this line profile here it shows more than uh, almost a 90% co-localization coefficient, whereas the conventional one using a streptavidin, that doesn't match, not as well as ours at least, it's, as in get it by this poor matching list numbers. So clearly indicating that our methods is quite versatile and universal, and yet working even better than the natural systems. Another advantage of this supramolecular latching system is that it can be reversible. As I said, natural system, it binds very tightly, but there's no competitor, so you cannot uh, release that reversibly. Whereas in our synthetic system, we have a wide range of gas molecules with a slightly different binding affinity that allows us to make it a latching off. So suppose you latch on with a, let's see, this molecule, then by treating this complex with stronger competitors such as this one, you can release that. So that can be useful in the proteomics, as you saw in a, in a minute. And as I said before, in this uh, post-genomic era, proteomics draws more attention. And this is a typical procedure for this uh, proteomic analysis. After enrichment and purification, proteins of the interest are subjected to the mass analysis. And as you know, this 
this math technique has been developed extensively over the last two decades. And uh, this, this job is more routine, more or less routine these days. However, still the problem is there's not much progress in this enrichment and purification step. And typically what people do is that, similar to what's uh, imaging, we attach the chemical handle, such as a bio, uh, biotin, and after the lysis, these biotin-related proteins are fished out, stepped up in an attached bead, and recovered. But it has a number of problems. I will tell you in more detail this actual example. So people pay much attention to the supply, plasma membrane proteomics because they do so many exciting functions, essential functions, including excerpt, cellular communication, and so on and so forth. So defining a plasma membrane proteomes is a very essential to not only to the biology, but also drug development. And most of the current drugs targeted, 70% uh, of the target targets this, the plasma membrane pr proteins. However, the problem is it's not easy because these are membrane-bound proteins. Therefore, they are very hydrophobic and heterogeneous and so on and so forth. So it's not uh, easy. But nevertheless, people have done this one using a streptavidin biotin technology. So as I said, first thing they, you need to do is uh, introduce a biotin, so biotin lesion. After lysis, you fish out this biotinylate proteins using a streptobin attached feed. After that, you apply the heat to recover this protein. During this process, what happens is a streptobin can be detached from the bead and contaminate the, the protein map. But more seriously, it can capture this endogenously biotinylate proteins that also contaminates the protein, proteomes, right? How much time do I have? Five? Okay, I can do that so, five minutes. So, we realize that as our supermicro latch can do this a better job in this case as well. So instead of biotinylation, we ferrocinylate and after lysis, we can capture the ferrocinylated proteins using our CB7 bead. But, but most nice, nice thing about this one is, as I said, we can recover this captured prints under a very mild condition using a, a strong competitor, as I illustrated here. Okay? I don't have time to talk about this one in more detail then. I'll skip this one. What's the next challenge then? As I said, proteins are constantly produced, modified, and interact with uh, other proteins in dynamic manner. So understanding of the dynamic nature of the proteins is very important, but that is not trivial. So in order to understand this the dynamic nature of this, one, what we need is a spatial temporal analysis of proteins. In other words, we have to pick up the proteins in specific area at a certain period of time and analyze. That's not as easy. And single method cannot do this uh, formidable job. So what we thought was, what if we combine these two techniques, synthetic and natural system together? So, so far I've been talking about the superiority of the sour system over this uh, conventional natural system. But streptobitin biotin system has been widely used in the bio community. And they are not going to give up on it easily. Anyway, most importantly, they are orthogonal in binding. So we can use these two methods at the same time and tackles 
this very challenging issue. Okay. So what we've been doing with this idea is that trying to identify the protein involved and communication between two organelles, such as mito and ER, that has been known to be very important. Okay. I don't have time to talk about say, any of this progress at this moment. As in the final stage of this uh, project, which takes about more than five years, and uh, we are ready to wrap up right now. Um, I'd like to talk, maybe uh, I hope I can be able to talk about this one and once I come back next time. If you allow me it's just one or two minutes, we can also... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we can use uh, this technique to produce biopharmaceutical at a lower cost and higher efficiency. As you see here, that's uh, six out of the some top ten best sellers is that protein drugs. For instance, Herceptin and so on and so forth. But the problem is that from patient point of view, it's a highly expensive. It's quite expensive. So one shot is just about five thousand US dollars. The reason is this is expensive, it requires rigorous purification procedure. And mostly done in is in case of monoclonal, monoclonal antibody based pro protein drug case, it requires say, so-called protein A purification step that involves this, the, the, the protein A that can bind this, the immunoglobins and very tightly. But uh, of course, this is kind of... The question is then, can you replace that step with this artificial synthetic system? As the answer is yes. So that's what I'm telling you in a minute. So first thing we did was to produce the Herceptin with a suitable handle that can be recognized by this ligation enzyme, such as the Sortase A, to introduce this adamantane moiety, and then well, we can fish out this Herceptin with a CB7 bead, as usual, and treating with a strong gas, we can recover this, yes, protein drugs. One thing, one nice thing about this system is that this bead can be recycled, okay? All right, what about efficiency? Well, as illustrated, compared to the protein, conventional protein A bead, we can isolate this protein some more efficiently, more specifically, just two times five fold better. And now, Another advantage of our system is it can be recycled, as I said here. So let me quickly summarize what I said to you. I introduced this uh, supramolecular latch as a new chemical tool to ligate two molecules together in non-covalent manner. That can be useful in many different areas, especially this biomedical annuals. So that can perhaps lead to this uh, precision, the drugs, and so on and so forth, eventually lead to the personalized medicine. With that, I'd like to thank all the co-workers and collaborators who actually did this work, especially I'd like to thank uh, Hyunwoo Ree of Seoul National University, Nam Gil Lee, and Chunak Oh, and all these uh, collaborators. And the funding was, has been provided by the IBS, that I'm very grateful to. Once again, thank you for the invitation. And I hope I'm running too much time, and thank you for your kind of attention. Thank you, Kimon, for a great talk. It's okay, you know. Uh, I know we uh, tried to speak two great lectures at uh, lunchtime, but we're okay. So we're gonna take one question, just in the interest of time. I know we have sessions uh, to come after us. Uh, or maybe I can ask the question, actually, because, <laughs> you know, I was looking. Sure. So um, how close are you to commercialization? Because if your method really is beating or in combination with the biotin avidin system, so have you patented this system? Are you, you know, going more towards, you know, uh, you know, you missed on calling your kimcurbiturals, but uh, maybe you'll have a... 
Kim uh, Sat, you know, like an uh, uh, essay. So I was wondering. <laughs> okay, so we have a patented uh, most of this uh, new technology. And, uh, but uh, we haven't commercialized uh, any of this one, unfortunately. I'm hoping that uh, still as uh, companies are interested in uh, commercializing this one. Is that would be wonderful. Oh, I guess, uh, you know, maybe Jonathan can help. You know, <laughs> commercialization is Jonathan's Please, definitely... Please, consider this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you so much for being here today, and let's thank our speaker. Thank you.